I'd like to welcome you to our information session, Leveraging Your Foreign Language Study to Enhance Career Opportunities, Perspectives from the Middlebury Institute of International Studies at Monterey. I'm Susan Cresson, Student Coordinator of the Russian Flagship Program. This event, which is part of our annual uh, International Education Week at UCLA, is sponsored not only by Flagship, but also by the Center for European and Russian Studies, the Center for World Languages, and the Department of Slavic East European and Eurasian languages and cultures. In our department, we offer courses in Russian, Bosnian, Serbian, Croatian, Montenegrin, Montenegrin um, Polish, Hungarian, Romanian, and Czech through independent study. And also through a collaboration with the program on Central Asia, we'll be offering Kazakh again this year in spring quarter, um, along with a two unit course on Central Asia. Today we have two speakers, two guests, Sarah Bidgood and Jennifer Matthew. Sarah is the director of the Eurasia Nonproliferation uh, Program at the James Martin Center for Nonproliferation non Studies in Monterey, California. Her research uh, focuses on a U.S. Soviet and U.S. Russian non-proliferation cooperation, and she is the co-editor of the book *Once and Future Partners: The United States, Russia, and Nuclear Non-Proliferation*, published by the International Institute for Strategic Studies in 2018. She also leads the Young Women in Non-Proliferation Initiative at the at the Center for Non-Proliferation Studies. Our second guest is Jennifer Matthew, the Marketing and Operations Manager at uh, Middlebury Institute of International Studies at Monterey. Jen is a longstanding guest of the Russian flagship program. She's been coming to the third year class for several years now to talk about graduate school and career opportunities that leverage a high level of Russian and to offer students an opportunity for one-on-one -on -one consultations. I like to encourage students to, to start thinking about pathways beyond UCLA already in their sophomore and junior years, the typical age for third year, when it's exciting, I think, rather than daunting. This year, Jen very generously agreed to expand the range of languages and the scope of her presentation for International Education Week. I'd like to ask you to mute your microphones during the presentation and to write your questions during the chat. Please also turn off your video uh, during the presentation for the purposes of the recording. We intend to post this presentation on the UCLA flagship website, but not the Q&A. At the end of the presentation, then we'll turn off the recording and address the questions in the order in which uh, you've written them. So once again, welcome to UCLA, to International Education Week, and to our information session on leveraging your foreign language study to enhance career opportunities. Hey, everybody, I'm going to share my screen here. Just give me one second. Um, can I get a thumbs up if you can see that? Thanks. Um, well, welcome everyone. Thank you for introducing us, Susan. Um, I just wanted to start by, you know, acknowledging that we're all facing Zoom fatigue and screen fatigue at the very least. So I really appreciate you coming out today. And, um, and just also thanks for having patience with us. Uh, just like all of you, we're working from home in response to the pandemic. So, you know, if you hear a dog in the background or a baby crying or internet gets a little choppy, um, thanks for bearing with us. Uh, as Susan said, my name is Jen and I work in our enrollment department. So I work with incoming students um, who are pursuing master's degrees with us. And, um, and I'm joined by Sarah as well. And before I let you, uh, before I let Sarah, excuse me, uh, jump in to talk about her work and how integral language skills are for what she does, I'm just gonna give you guys a brief overview of the um, Middlebury Institute so that you have kind of that context as well. So at MISS, as we're referred to since um, our full name, Middlebury Institute of International Studies at Monterey is a bit of a mouthful. Um, this is an overview of, of our kind of fast facts. We are uh, the graduate school from Middlebury College, which is in Vermont, but we are actually located in Monterey, California, and we are just the grad school, so we only have MA students on our campus. We currently have 764 master's degree seeking students 
and of those, um, they hail from 53 different countries and speak 45 different native languages, um, the current cohort. So it's a small but really diverse and interesting student population. Language education is absolutely foundational to MISS. It is what we were founded with. Uh, it remains a focus in our core curriculum across all of our master's programs. The languages offered and the levels required do vary by program. So I'm happy to answer questions about them if we have specific ones um, when we get to that Q&A section, but it's hard to talk about them sort of in general terms uh, when I'm trying to do a quick overview. Um, just so that you have an idea of what we offer, um, MISS offers 12 master's degrees. And as you can see, many are in more niche fields. Uh, we have our school divided in half. So we have the Graduate School of International Policy and Management and the Graduate School of Translation, Interpretation and Language Education. Um, the language requirements do vary depending on the two grad schools. So depending on if you're interested more in working in the language or potentially using language while working uh, in a policy field, uh, that's gonna vary. Additionally, I did wanna highlight, we do currently offer a dual degree program. This is gonna be specifically aimed at students who are interested in WMD nonproliferation and US-Russian relations. So if that's uh, something that's of interest to you, we have the ability for students to come to us and earn a master's degree in nonproliferation and terrorism studies. And then also at the same time, get a master's degree in international affairs from Moscow State International excuse me, Institute of International Relations, MGIMO. So that's a really amazing offer that, um, that we have. So I like to highlight that, even though it's not technically a separate master's degree. So MISS is a very professionally focused school. Everything we do in our programs is meant to prepare students to get a job quickly after graduation or even before graduation. Um, so we integrate career and academic advising from the beginning. Students uh, can't even register for classes without connecting to their advisor who advises for both uh, the academic side and the career side. We also have robust career information, career outcome information, I should say, on our website. Um, but to just to give you an idea, 94% of our alumni were working when we surveyed them at our one year after graduation and only 3% were seeking employment. Also of that alumni base, 64% were using a secondary language in their daily work. Lastly, I like to highlight partnerships um, just because funding education is something that everyone wants to hear about. Um, these are just a few. We have well over 30 partnerships as well as partner uh, institutions, but um, we do guarantee scholarships for admitted students from any of these partnerships. As an example that might apply to someone uh, in the room, if you are a language flagship alumni, we waive your application fee and guarantee $16,000 per year in scholarship off your tuition. So just to give you an idea of what one of those looks like. So without further ado, I will turn the floor over to Sarah to talk more and I will stop my screen share. Great, thank you so much, uh, Jen, and, and a huge thank you to Susan as well. It's really a pleasure to be with you here today. Um, my name is Sarah Bidgood, and, and as Susan kindly mentioned in her introduction, I direct our Eurasia Nonproliferation Program at the Center for Nonproliferation Studies. Um, and you know, it can we're sort of already getting into the acronym soup of, of MIS and the nonproliferation space, but just to sort of help you orient yourselves. CNS, the place where I work, is one of a number of different research organizations that is part of the Middlebury Institute of International Studies. And so we focus specifically on preventing the spread of weapons of mass destruction, of generating kind of policy relevant recommendations for a variety of different stakeholders in the United States and abroad, and in contributing to, to at least in my case, um, ensuring that the United States and, and Russia are working um, productively together to the extent possible on this very critical issue. So um, I, I, I want to talk a little bit about sort of, you know, the work that we do at CNS, the ways in which I use my Russian language skills on a daily basis in my work, which I do. Um, 
But I also want to talk to you from the perspective of an alumna of the Institute, because I am also a graduate of the Nonproliferation and Terrorism Studies MA program. And so I'm going to share some slides with you today that, that sort of cut across um, a number of the different programs that we offer at MIS and opportunities for students like yourselves who are interested in, in Russian language to, to study um, Russian at the, at the graduate level um, at MIS in ways that are relevant to the different, different disciplines and different uh, MA programs that we offer. But I also want to tell you a little bit more about my work since, as you, you know, may have deduced from Susan's introduction, I'm very interested in ensuring that we have um, a diverse next generation cohort of experts like yourselves with deep language and area studies expertise to do the kinds of work that we do. So I'm gonna give you a little um, pitch and hopefully get you interested in thinking about careers in this field. So uh, let me share my screen really quickly here. Um, and I'm going to play from the start here. So um, the first thing I wanna sort of tell you a little bit about is my own you know, background and my own experience studying Russian. Um, I was a, a Russian language and literature major at Wellesley College. And I was really focused on wanting to communicate, wanting to be able to read um, the classics, you know, not in translation. I, I, I was very interested in kind of Russian culture, but I didn't have a really great sense for what to do with that passion. I didn't think that I wanted to pursue a career in academia. I wasn't really sure that that, that was quite the thing for me. And I didn't know how else to apply that skill set. Um, and so there was a lot of kind of, um, you know, I would say a period of time where I, I felt a little bit lost and a little bit like I'm going to have to make a decision between this thing that I'm really passionate about, which is Russian and Russian studies, and being able to pay my rent and, and sort of, you know, have a roof over my head. And it wasn't until I got to Ms. and to Middlebury that I really felt like I knew how to kind of professionalize that passion. And, and I found my path to do that through the Nonproliferation and, 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 and uh, Terrorism Studies MA program. Um, so I wanted to bring sort of a, an understanding of the shared interests of the United States and Russia, the ways in which I saw um, opportunities for cooperation to bear so that I could help to improve our international security situation. And um, because, as Jen mentioned in her remarks, our program is so oriented towards helping students professionalize their areas of passion, I was able to, to do that. And, and I was able to learn how to do that through the courses that are offered at MIS. So for me, that ended up being sort of the perfect, um, I think application of the skills that I'm interested in. And so I'll tell you a little bit about what that work looks like in case that's something that, that resonates with you and with your own interests. But I also wanna be sure to talk about the Graduate Initiative in Russian Studies, which is a non-degree granting program at Middlebury, at the Middlebury Institute that gives students the opportunity to study Russian in the context of the areas that they're already interested in. So for me, that looked like um, listening to Russian experts in the security space talk about um, preventing the spread of nuclear weapons in Russia. So I was both learning sort of um, the Russian perspective on these issues, but I was also developing a vocabulary that I would use in my professional life to communicate with colleagues in, in Russian in Russia, which I do all the time. Um, so I want to talk to you a little bit about some of those opportunities. Um, I want to talk to you about the ways in which they have informed my own work on Russian, and then I really want to answer your questions and, and leave time to have that kind of a discussion. So the Graduate Initiative in Russian Studies comprises a number of different components to it. Um, and I should say that when I was a student, I had the privilege of being a, a project manager for the Graduate Initiative in Russian Studies. So it's a, a program that is very near and dear to my heart. And as I mentioned, a key component of this program is the visiting visiting scholars program. So obviously things look a little bit different this year as they do for everybody. We've we've had vir virtual visits from from some of these scholars, but in a typical year, you know, we will have the foremost experts from Russia and the former Soviet space come to Monterey, deliver lectures in Russian. Um, that that help inform students, um, not just in terms of, of sort of developing their language skills, but also with respect to to the scholarship and research that is happening in Russia in these really, really critical areas that we don't always hear about if you're just operating in translation. So this is just an example of, of some of the scholars who visited Ms. Um, this fall, but they include some really, some of the most prestigious names um, sort of within different facets of, of 
this field. So for those of you who know Vladimir Posner, he's somebody who is um, has really been a, a sort of um, important voice in 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 U.S. Russia relations. He is the person who who um, sort of created the original telebridges, space bridges between the United States and and Russia to help um, facilitate citizen to citizen diplomacy. And so that those are the kinds of people who are coming to MIS and with whom our students have the opportunity uh, to interact. And you can see a full list of all of the various scholars who have come to MIS over the years since this program has been in existence on the website. But this is just a, an example from, from our recent semester here. Um, another really exciting component of the Graduate Initiative in Russian Studies is the Monterey Summer Symposium on Russia. And once you're sort of in graduate school and once you're, you're in that, that um, next place, whether it is uh, with us at MIS or somewhere else, I, I, I would really encourage you to consider applying for this program. It is a seven week course of studies for graduate students and for young professionals who are interested in and, and expert in, in Russian relations. Um, and it combines a sort of interdisciplinary curriculum that focuses not just on sort of the security space, which is where my interests lie, but also on arts, culture, science, um, technology, um, all kinds of different facets where US and Russian relations are particularly important. And the end result is that students really come out of, of this intensive summer program, not only with incredible language skills, because it is uh, it, you have to be bilingual in order to, to participate in this program, but you also have this really deep sense of the ways in which all of these aspects of language and culture um, are related and come to bear when we're talking about um, important um, issues of the day. The other thing that the Graduate Initiative in Russian Studies does and in which I was very deeply involved as a student is translating public opinion polls that are produced by the Levada Center. The Levada Center is the leading um, independent um, polling agency in Russia. They take the pulse of um, regular Russian people with respect to many, many different critical issues, um, whether they pertain uh, to sort of security and understanding where Russia is in terms of its relations with allies and adversaries, but also understanding, you know, how do how do Russian people feel about Vladimir Putin? How do they feel about, um, you know, nuclear weapons? How do they feel about um, elections? How do they feel about the U.S. elections? All of those kinds of things. Oftentimes, that data, these data, are not available to Americans who don't speak Russian. And so the Graduate Initiative in Russian Studies, I think, plays a really critical role in translating these polls and making those data um, available to a variety of stakeholders in the United States, You know, whether they're people in the media or researchers. Um, uh, that's a really important contribution to, I think, the discourse on Russia uh, in the United States. Um, there are also opportunities to travel and to conduct research in Russia that the Graduate Initiative in Russian Studies makes available to MIS students. Um, so in 2021, there will be three research and travel grants for graduate work in Russia. Um, these help students with advanced language skills go to Russia for internship and research purposes. I was the beneficiary of one of these, these research and travel grants, and so I was very fortunate to be able to go to Russia in, in the fall of 2015 to participate in something called the Stanford US Russia Forum, which some of you may have heard of and might be interested in, um, and also to participate in a summer uh, international school that the Peer Center, which is a, a, a Russian think tank, um, leads for students who are interested in nuclear issues. And so through, with the support of the Graduate Initiative in Russian Studies, I was able to kind of create an independent study for myself um, that combined these two two very important uh, research, collaborative research projects and research opportunities. And I can tell you that, you know, in my professional work today, the people that I met through those programs are people with whom I stay in very close contact, um, sometimes almost in daily or weekly contact, um, and with whom I continue to collaborate in my work. So that's, those are the kinds of um, kind of cohort building uh, research opportunities that you have access to if you're a student at MIS um, through the GIRS program. Um, some of the newer opportunities that, that did not exist when I was a student at MIS, but that I've been so fortunate to kind of be able to watch come into existence and take advantage of in my own work are things like the bridge. This is one of the newer initiatives that is part of the Graduate Initiative in Russian Studies. And it's helping students and young professionals and researchers learn about different opportunities to conduct 
archival research um, in Russia and the former Soviet space. There is often, I think, um, even in my own work, a sort of misperception that um, there aren't the kinds of um, archival materials available on the Russian side that there are, for instance, on the US side. And in some cases, there's some, some credence to, to that argument, I think. But what the bridge does is it helps students and, and young professionals understand what materials and what repositories of, of primary source data are available to them. And in many cases, how to access them from the comfort of our own homes as we're all unable to travel right now. Um, so these are the kinds of resources that the Graduate Initiative in Russian Studies helps to make available, not just to students who are at MIS, but, but you know, students like yourselves who are kind of thinking about what's next. So I would really encourage you again to visit the website, um, to explore some of these for yourselves. There are wonderful lectures by some of the leading um, Russian Studies scholars in the United States and abroad, where they explain how they make use of all of these different materials um, in ways that you know, from which I have learned a great deal myself, I have to say, just from watching these. So I, I would really um, encourage you to check those out and I hope you find them as useful as I have. So having sort of explained the ways in which you can study Russian and, and continue to professionalize your language expertise at MIS, I wanna switch gears a little bit and talk to you about the ways that this self-same program has informed my own work that I now do at CNS. And I wanna begin because I know that not everybody is sort of steeped in and focused on nuclear issues in quite the same way that my colleagues and I are every day. Um, I wanna talk a little bit by sort of making sure we're all on the same page as far as you know why, why does non-proliferation matter? Why does it matter that we prevent the spread of nuclear weapons? And one of the ways that I think is really helpful to do that is to look at the numbers of nuclear warheads that we estimate um, the nine countries that possess them to have. And I think this chart does a really nice job of showing us exactly what the scope of the problem is that we're trying to address. And I wanna sort of draw your attention to a couple of things as you're looking at this. The first is that, um, as I said, there are nine countries that currently possess nuclear weapons. Five of them are what's called um, non-proliferation treaty nuclear weapon states, which means that they are sort of legally allowed to possess nuclear weapons, I suppose, in the lexicon of um, international organizations and international treaties. Um, and while this is, you know, too many countries who possess nuclear weapons, it's also a lot fewer than um, sort of U.S and Soviet leaders thought at the beginning of the nuclear age. So some of you might know that um, Kennedy in 1960 thought that there could be as many as 25 nuclear weapon possessing countries by the end of his term in office. That didn't happen. And um, part of what we try to understand in our research as, as people who work at think tanks is why, um, what was effective in preventing the spread of nuclear weapons to more countries. And how can we kind of build upon those lessons from the past for today at a moment when we are sort of once again um, really cognizant of the threat posed by nuclear weapons because it's become a bigger part of our public discourse. The other thing I want to draw your attention to as you're looking at this, and I think this will be of interest to those of you who are studying the US and Russia, is the fact that the United States and the Russian Federation possess vastly more nuclear weapons than any of the other countries that we're looking at on this chart. And this might look like a huge number, and it is. Both of these countries together possess around 13,000 uh, nuclear weapons, as you can see from this chart. But the remarkable thing to me is that this actually represents about an 83% reduction from what these arsenals look like at the height of the Cold War. And so again, as a researcher who is interested in kind of understanding how is it that we can work together with Russia to prevent not only the spread of nuclear weapons to other countries, but also to decrease the number of nuclear weapons in our arsenals. How did we get here? How did we go from having so many more nuclear weapons to this still very large number, but one that is much reduced? And so that's been a major focus of my research. I do use archival sources and I use interviews and I use the past to help inform the kinds of recommendations that I put forward for policymakers today. So that's sort of um, planting the seed of, of ways in which you can bring your own expertise to bear here if this is the kind of thing that interests you. So the other thing that you know, I, I often try to tell students when I'm sort of talking to undergraduates in particular about the kinds of work that they might find interesting 
these challenges are evolving. So the, the chart that we just looked at previously, that's a dynamic chart. Those numbers go up and down. Um, we hope that they go down more often than not, but sometimes that's not the case. And in fact, we are in an environment right now in the United States when we don't know what the future of arms control is going to look like. The one remaining treaty between the United States and the Russian Federation that limits the number of nuclear weapons both sides can possess is about to expire in February of 2021. We think that the Biden administration will be interested in extending this treaty for another five years, that's what they've said, but time is ticking. And um, particularly because of you know, the challenges posed by sort of the election, COVID, all of that sort of thing, we don't have a lot of time um, to extend that treaty. So part of what we do in my work is try to think really hard about um, what other instruments are available to us and what are the ways that we can kind of um, help to prevent the spread of nuclear weapons either up or out um, in the absence of some of the instruments that we have previously been able to rely upon. And in doing that kind of work, I spend a lot of time thinking about the ways that the crisis in US-Russia relations impacts upon the arms control and non-proliferation environment. And there are many, many ways we, you know, we can sort of go into some of them in Q&A and you can probably imagine from your own research what a number of the ones that I will say are. But I think understanding sort of the perceived threats from Russia, the perceived threats from the United States, um, understanding the ways in which um, kind of US-Russia relations have developed over time is incredibly important context for that work. And so as you guys are thinking about your next steps and thinking about ways that you can bring your kind of passion and interest for Russia to bear um, in the security space, I think that is an area um, where your expertise would be really welcome and necessary because these are evolving landscapes and we need to be able to look at these wicked problems from a lot of different um, angles that your perspectives can inform. Um, and so this kind of leads me to the, the point that I always really try to make when I speak to students, which is that there are so many different disciplines that are relevant to sort of non-proliferation and arms control uh, and nuclear policy related work. So one you've heard me talk a lot about is history. And um, the book that Susan mentioned that I co-edited in 2018 is a series of historical case studies. So my co-authors and I were looking back into the archival material at the documentary record to understand, for instance, you know, how did the United States and the Soviet Union come together in you know, the summer of 1977 to prevent South Africa from testing a nuclear weapon? That's one of the cases that I looked at. Um, what made that kind of cooperation work? How was that possible at a time when the kind of high political environment between the US and Soviet Union was so unconducive to that type of cooperation in this really sensitive area? That looks to me a lot like the environment that we have today. So I wanna understand from history what made that type of cooperation work and whether there are strategies that we can employ today that would help us do a similar type of cooperation even if the bigger political environment isn't really friendly to that type of work. But that's just me. There are you know, many, many other kinds of disciplines that you can bring to bear here. Um, and so some of them that I really like to highlight in particular are computer science. I don't know if any of you are sort of interested in computer science or in, in, in geospatial imagery analysis or any of that kind of thing, but my colleagues and I make frequent use of those kinds of tools at CNS because we want to understand what's happening in other countries and we can't necessarily go there and get access to you know, their nuclear test facilities or um, their missile launch facilities. We have to use uh, ground imagery analysis. We have to look at photographs from the ground. We have to look at satellite imagery to understand what is happening. And so for instance, um, some of you might kind of be aware of an incident that happened in August of 2019 in, um, in Arkhangelsk, Russia, where um, there was an explosion and a release of radioactivity and sort of no understanding um, and no real discussion from official sources about exactly what had happened. And so my colleagues and I were able to use satellite imagery to look at the site where this event happened and to understand that it was probably related to a recovery effort of a Russian nuclear powered cruise missile from the bottom of the ocean floor. And that was all sorts of things that we were able to understand from looking at commercial satellite imagery to which we have access. 
And so that's the kind of thing that you can learn how to do at MIS, but it's really important to also have the language expertise to understand what is being said in the in the sort of official public discourse about what's happening to be able to understand what people on the ground are saying. Um, so that's that's kind of one way that you can use your 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 Russian language skills and also perhaps your interest in GIS or computer science to kind of bring all of these things together in the service of making the world a safer place. Um, the other one I really like to highlight because I think that it is less obvious is the importance of kind of the visual arts in, in the work that we do. So part of our mandate at CNS is to help inform the public about nuclear issues. So we're, we're also making you know, policy recommendations for, for people who are decision makers in government, but we also want the public to be able to understand what is happening and to be able to make up their own minds about what they think about these issues. And visual arts can be really, really helpful here. So if you, you know, write a report, maybe somebody will read that. If you make a chart that shows you know, the scope of a problem, sometimes people find that to be much more compelling. And so if that's the kind of thing that you find interesting, you know, if you both like Russian and you also like media or, or um, you know, visual arts or, or you know, music or dance, you can combine those interests um, in ways that are really impactful in our space. And so the kind of bottom line here that I like to try to drive home when I talk to students is that this might feel like a very, um, specific and narrow field, but it is actually a lens to look at the things that you're already interested in doing. So we can go into in Q&A to sort of, I, I'd love to hear more about the specific areas that you're interested in. I can help you try to make some connections with our field because I think that can be really um, sort of mysterious, but it can be interesting to hear about um, if you're trying to think about what is next for you. But these are some of the, the very um, this is the tip of the iceberg of the disciplines that are relevant to our field, and it's a really a very long and exciting list. So the good news is that, you know, I guess it's good news. It, it also is sort of a commentary on the state of the world, but we really do need more people with all of these various skill sets to do this kind of work. So um, we are on, um, I would say, sort of the cusp of a potential personnel crisis in our field in a lot of different areas um, by 2023. 40% of the employees at the National Nuclear Security Administration will be eligible to retire. Some of you guys might know that the NNSA is the, um, the part of US government that oversees our nuclear stockpile in the United States. Regardless of how you feel about nuclear weapons and the US possession of nuclear weapons, we certainly want that arsenal to be safe and secure while it exists. And if you have a whole bunch of people who are going to leave the workforce or might potentially leave the workforce in the next few years, that's a real source of concern. That means we need to have a new cadre of experts who have all of these different skills um, to be ready to step in and kind of take their place. The same thing is true at the State Department. The same thing is true with respect to the Foreign Service. So um, there are plenty of opportunities to continue to do this work. Um, we need new experts to step in to these roles. And as I'll sort of describe, we want to make sure that this is a diverse group of experts and people who really um, bring a lot of different experiences and backgrounds to bear to this discourse, um, because that is really important to the outcomes in our field. So uh, as Susan mentioned in her introductory remarks, I also lead a program at CNS called the Young Women in Nonproliferation Initiative which focuses on increasing gender diversity in our field. And that is something that is becoming an increasingly important kind of focus area, I think within the discourse in our space. And I'm very happy to see that because we do not have a lot of gender diversity in our field. And that's something that we're working very hard to change. So you can see here, these are just kind of some statistics um, from various sectors of the non-proliferation and nuclear policy space. You've got international negotiations, that's the TPNW negotiations here, the self-same NNSA, Nuclear Security Administration that I mentioned before, and then uh, researchers at DC-based think tanks that focus on international security issues. And the part that's in darker blue, that's the percentage of, of women who work at these various organizations or who were part of these negotiations. Um, and I find this to be really quite shocking when you think about the fact that, you know, um, women make up 50% of the workforce or so. Um, so we have a lot of work to do in our field to try to make things more equitable. And that's something that we are very interested in doing at CNS. 
Um, this also, I'm you know, talking here about gender diversity, but this applies to all kinds of diversity. We really need um, different voices, different perspectives in order to be able to do our work effectively, in order to be able to tackle these really longstanding challenges in ways that make a difference. And so um, that's something I'm very committed to doing at MIS and at CNS. And I would love um, to answer any questions that, that you all might have about sort of where you fit into that and where you might be able to bring your perspective, your voice to bear here. Um, nobody has you know, jurisdiction over nuclear weapons issues, over policy issues. We all have something to contribute there. And I'm happy to help you either in the context of this conversation or later figure out where your place might be there. So Jen, I'm gonna pause here, I think, um, and I'd love to answer any questions that, that students might have, but um, thank you again. It's just been a pleasure to, to have the chance to talk to you and I'm looking forward to a conversation. Thanks.